All right, thank you, T Mac. All right, I know it's getting late in the afternoon, so everybody stretch out and uh, notice the title. I used mocking instead of uh, simulating or emulating. I don't know if uh, what you would call what I'm doing emulation or not. Um, but then there's a subtitle. So, why do drivers still have bugs? I've been doing VR for a while now in my career. And, um, you know, when I first started doing VR and Linux, they told me the bugs are in the drivers, and they're still in the drivers. And so towards the end, we'll get into that a little bit about why I think that uh, Linux uh, still has buggy drivers, um, or why drivers are buggy in general. So who am I? Uh, if you don't know who I am, uh, I'm the VP of research at Great Key Labs. Um, I'm an offensive security researcher for most of my career. Um, there's my CV if you're really interested in the, in the details. And, uh, we have Great Key Labs at Magnet Forensics. So we were formerly Grayshift, um, and now we're Magnet Forensics. Um, and in you know, two seconds, we are a shop that will uh, assist law enforcement in recovering data from digital devices that they find at crime scenes. So mostly that's uh, uh, phones. So why am I here? Uh, a while ago, uh, somebody new to the industry came to me and said, so how does one actually find the bugs? And I was like, that's a great question. Um, they say, you, you kind of know how to find the bugs, or at least you continue to do it. How do, how do I find the bugs? And I said, well, there's lots of information out there. You should go read a lot of blogs, but that's not a very satisfying answer. And so there's lots of uh, written about exploitation methods, and they always start with a bug. You'll be like, I have this bug, I have the CV, I have this end day, and I'm going to exploit it. And those are really, really good write-ups. I appreciate those write-ups. Um, but they don't really tell you how to do the vulnerability discovery. So my answer after I came back to him was like, basically this long list of things that I do every time I assess a target. You know, I collect everything, I select an attack surface, I'm auditing or reversing building, debugging, writing parsers for input, like grab a bunch of inputs, write the parsers, read the specs. I try to emulate it, I try to instrument it and write a bunch of tests and fuzz it and then find some end days and reproduce those so I can really get to know what's going on. And it's not an exact science. Most of the time I'm just kind of fumbling around trying to figure out where are the bugs, where are the weak spots, and I have some intuition built up over time about where I might find them at interfaces of different pieces of code, like this is sloppy code, this is not very good architecture, where might they make the mistakes, but it's really not a great you know, exact science. So, and I don't know exactly when to stop. Uh, you know, I might find a bug and be like, I'm out of energy, so that's it, I found the bug. Uh, but there might be more bugs, um, but either way, if I, as soon as I find what I've achieved, uh, what I want, uh, I'll move on unless I just eventually run out of energy and then it kind of sticks in my brain for years and I never give up on it. But that's something that maybe offensive people have it built into them. Um, so he came back to me after a while and said, so how does one actually do research on drivers? Uh, and uh, that was a little different problem. It was kind of like, well, you have to pick on a good attack surface. You're gonna be constrained in a ways that you're not constrained in, uh, in user space. So you're not gonna have uh, maybe the access to talk to the driver. You're gonna be in a particular context. There might be a Linux security module in your way. There might be DAC and Mac rules that limit you. And also emulation and instrumentation are gonna be harder. And that's basically the, the point of this talk is to kind of enable those emulation and instrumentation steps uh, so that we can actually do VR. So getting to the first topic, uh, how do you pick a good uh, attack service? So if you're looking at attack services, looking at code for a long time, there's some features of different uh, code that or, and attack or uh, targets that you might actually uh, you know come to find really attractive. So is it a complex code base? Does it have access to a lot of resources? Um, what are the Mac and the DAC rules? Discretionary and mandatory access control. Um, is it consistent, especially in, when it comes to Android? Android, the word fragmentation just doesn't seem to encapsulate how fragmented Android is. I really, I just can't stress that enough if you've ever worked in the Android environment, how fragmented it is. Um, it should be slow and steadily changing, kind of linearly changing. You kind of get version after version after version. That's really nice. Um, and then discrete releases, if it has a discrete release, because a lot of vendors will kind of build their drivers or their code into one monolith and kind of give you the kernel and all the drivers and all the code together. And they're like, here's our board and here's our BSP and here's our code for the driver. And they, they don't really version it, but they are compelled to release it uh, given GPL so you can find it, but does that actually equate to what you're looking at on the device? Who knows? Sometimes you'll be able, you might have to reverse it. 
So, and uh, not written by the core Linux developers. A, a lot of the LTS kernels are fuzzed very well, and they should be. Um, and proprietary. If it was proprietary, maybe you have fewer eyeballs. It's been my experience that proprietary code tends to have more bugs. We can debate that, but uh, open source code seems to be a little more reliable, but there's also different you know, scopes it's trying to do different things. Um, but I, I attribute it to fewer eyeballs are on the code. So when you're looking at uh, Linux uh, kernel drivers, fewer of these services um, meet all these criteria except for coprocessors. Coprocessors are great. So like your GPU, your NPU, the DSP, a lot of times there's a lot of access to those things from different contexts, um, and they're very complicated things, and they have a lot of resources that they can um, you know, manage and, and mismanage. So there's a lot of opportunity for this complex code base that you have access to um, in order to do like a privesque or a sandbox, sandbox escape uh, by attacking the, uh, the kernel directly. So what is difficult about drivers? Well, like I said earlier, the emulation and the instrumentation are more difficult. So the code might not be open source. You might have to go find it in a leak somewhere. So downloading kernels from like Open Samsung, for instance, you might find code in there that they've added um, that'll give you a version of it, but there might not be an official release from the vendor. Um, and it might not be revisioned. So you might not have discrete revisions. So you might not know where you are exactly. And then the other big thing is introspection in the kernel is hard. Uh, on a production device, and you might not have introspection from the peripheral device. So you might not be able to look at it, JTAG or uh, core sites, you might not be able to have that introspection into what's going on in this thing you're talking to. So what are the options? Um, you can black box fuzz a prediction, uh, production device, you can go buy one from AT&T or, or what have you and, and sit down and you know, actually black box whatever you can touch from what the context that you have available to you. Uh, that could be as simple, in, at least in the Android case, as ADB. It could be you're in some other process somehow, but you only have a certain amount of servers that you can touch to actually attack the kernel. You can stare at the artifacts, so you can download the firmware. You can rip all the things out of the firmware. You can grab like the open source distro. You can look at that, and if there's any logs, uh, you can grab those from like Git if they've actually got the, the code revisioned in Git. Sometimes they don't. Um, or you can find a development device and all the supporting document and hardware and so forth, but usually they're very costly. Uh, usually they fell off the back of a truck. Um, uh, one particular example is Thundercom boards. So uh, Qualcomm has, you know, there's these boards uh, that host the Qualcomm chipsets that are okay. You know, you, you can get a kernel compiled and get it on there and kind of introspect that, but they are still aren't uh, as easy to use and they're expensive. So there are ways that you can do this, uh, but you're kind of at two extremes. On one extreme, you've got a production device, which you know, is locked up, uh, and it should be, and you're really just black boxing it until the thing crashes, and maybe you found a crash, maybe you didn't. The instrumentation is hard. Um, or you're trying to reproduce an end day on a production device, and you're throwing it at the, uh, at the device, and you really don't know why it's not landing. You really don't know what's going on inside. So, uh, and the other extreme is that you're creating like a full emulation environment, uh, you know, kind of guessing, and then, uh, or finding a, a full development environment. So both of those are hard, both of those are expensive. Um, so I was wondering if there was a middle ground, um, and it turns out that most drivers are built in an environment where they have to make a pre-silicone driver version. So the idea is that you've got a set of developers that are developing user space libraries for whoever's gonna use this device, and then you have another set of developers that are doing the hardware, and they're, they're, they've got an API, they've got a spec, and they're kind of working independently and in parallel. So there needs to be some middle driver that bridges the two while it's not working, while the hardware isn't working yet. So if you look at some drivers, you'll find maybe references to pre-silicone phases or just register maps that aren't used or other things that aren't used, and you're kind of like, okay, what is this code? Because they're not exactly, the code isn't exactly tight. You know, there's lots of extra loose ends that they don't really care about that they just kind of leave laying around that you can, kinda, you can guess things. So back in 2020, uh, actually this paper was in 2016, uh, there was a uh, set of developers at ARM that decided to release something called No Molly. And what they were trying to do is performance test uh, the Molly GPU, and uh, they didn't have the actual GPU. Um, I'm not sure if they were in the pre-silicone environment or they just didn't have access to it, but they made a uh, kind of a what I call a mock driver, um, something that actually will, you know, complete all the hardware operations as though it was there, uh, according to the driver, according to the kernel, but of course not rendering anything. Um, and they wrote this paper and they released it. Um, that kind of got me thinking. So 
back in 2020, there was version 0 through 29 released. And thank you, ARM, so much for having discrete releases on a website for generations of their GPU. So you can find version 0, version 1, and you can diff them. That is an amazing thing to be able to do when it comes to kernel code. Um, and actually, it's very reliably um, what you find on the device. I have found instances where the OEMs and the vendors have modified drivers later on in order to add things to structures and so forth, but it's, it's pretty rare. So for the most part, you can be very sure that what you're downloading from the website is what's going to be running on the device. The device will tell you what version it has. Um, and like I said, you can diff them and they're discrete and they're open. Um, much appreciation for that. Um, so in any driver concerning Linux, you're going to have something called kconfig. So at least you should. Um, and if you're not familiar with kbuild and the build system that's in Linux, um, it's, uh, it's not bad. So it's an acquired taste. You have to kind of, you know, get used to it. Um, but uh, everything that build, every build system is kind of bad in its own way. So let's just get that out of the way. Um, but yeah, checking out the, the driver user manual is kconfig. I assume if you buy the hardware or the chipset and you're the integrator of this particular piece of, of hardware, that they give you some manual that they tell you, like, here's how you actually use this thing and here's more information. However, they do include quite a lot of information in kconfig here. And so there's one particular config there that I pulled uh, out of the paper called Molly no Molly. So config Molly no Molly. And this is the GPU driver from ARM. Um, and of course, you can start reading it and it says, it's great description, so thanks for the information, but it says, basically you can test the driver in a simulated environment whereby the hardware is not physically present. That sounds exactly what I want. I want to be able to fuzz it. I want to be able to test it. Um, I want to be able to debug it and step through every line with symbols. Um, and so the hardware doesn't need to be present and you can test the majority of the hardware, right? So I was very excited. I was like, this is exactly what I'm looking for to do VR on this surface. Um, and like I said, this is version 29, back in 2020. And, and so uh, hopefully you can read this. Uh, but basically, I kind of went step by step, and this is the information you might get from ARM themselves when you're integrating things. Is I downloaded a vanilla kernel at the time, 419. I downloaded the driver version at the time, version 29. Untarred it, you know, uh, and then I copied the code into the, the, the source tree. So I'm going to do an in-tree build, where I'm actually going to build it in the tree. Um, I decided, to, I, I put this in one terminal, but uh, I, I don't normally just use said to edit things. Um, but this kind of gets the point across. Uh, I wish I was that good and just, just crank out some said commands. Uh, but no, I, uh, here I've got some said commands that'll, that'll uh, actually uh, hook it into the uh, K build system. So you've got K, uh, K config there being hooked into the video section. And you've got the, the make file for the GPU area or directory, uh, including the ARM directory now. Um, then we add these configs to the, and these are from kconfig, add these configs to the uh, de default config for x86. This is all x86. That's what they wrote config molly no molly for was x86. Um, and of course, I'm cheating a little bit here because these parameters I actually took off of a config, a proc config.gz from a uh, um, Samsung device at the time. Um, and of course, I had to read the kconfig and I had to turn some things off and I was like, let's just, you know, I'm just playing around. I want to see how far I can get. So, of course, I build it, make def config, check the config. It's got all the configs in there. Great. And then, of course, I run it and it fails. And so, I don't know if you can read this, but it failed because this header file doesn't exist. Molly K base model Linux dot H. So, no such file directory. And I, I look around for that file everywhere. I'm looking at on the, online. I'm looking in versions 0 through 29. I'm trying to find it. Uh, and I, I really have no luck. So it turns out that they had ripped the model out. They had actually built the whole thing. They, they, they released this paper, but they were keeping it internal. Um, and so I was like, all right, fine. Uh, you've got all the hooks in there. You've got all the driver setup code. You've got everything that I need. Can I just reproduce your model? Like, what do I have to do to make you know, the model? Just get it working. So uh, I go through the what I call compiler-driven code completion, which is me just <laughs> compile it, touch a file. Oh, you're missing that header. I'll make that header for you. So, uh, and, and of course, I don't expect any of this to work. So, and then you, you compile again, and then you find, oh, these symbols are missing, these function calls. They're calling functions that don't exist now. They exist uh, in one version. Uh, so you can go find the signatures, because the kernel config was changed. So you can go and find the, uh, the version of these and find the signature for them. 
um, but they don't have uh, an implementation when you turn on this compiler flag because they've been removed. Uh, presumably the model had provided these. So after many, many, many iterations of that back and forth where I'm touching include files, adding missing structures, which I don't know the names of the structures, or I know the names, I don't know the sizes of the structures exactly or what they have in, in, inside them, um, and function declarations, um, I get down to linking and I'm like, oh, Linker gives me a few symbols that are missing. I add some of those in. Um, and of course, I need to extrapolate what's the behavior of each one of these functions at this point, right? I know what the names are, and the names are very semantic. Like, it kind of tells me, if you look back here, you've got GPU device create, GPU device destroy, um, you know, dumb, dummy perf count base. Um, there's some information you can pull off semantically, but this is a lot of work, and I was kind of like, eh, it's a lot of work, I don't want to do this so much, and I don't know if what I'm doing is right. I'm getting pretty far in at this point. So I did find online that uh, along with that paper, they did release a model, um, and the model turns out not compatible whatsoever with the kernel. It was written for a Gem5 emulator, which I've never used. So um, I, don't, I don't know if anybody's heard of that, uh, Gem5. But uh, it's, it's a product out there, and it's written in C++, so obviously not compatible with the, the C kernel. Um, and uh, so, but that doesn't mean I can't go in through and, and read it. So I audit the, the, the C++, and of course it's layer after layer of abstraction. I love C++ for applications, but when you're trying to do system stuff, it, I don't know. The older I get, the more I don't like abstractions. I'm like, just tell me what you're doing. But that's just maybe me being old, older. I don't look it, but anyway, so. Uh, I do like when I'm auditing code or anything really that uh, doesn't really seem to fit in Ida or Binja or um, Ghidra. Uh, I use mind maps. So I don't know if anybody else has used these. Xmind is a great tool. Um, it's just kind of a, a whiteboard where you can just make boxes with arrows and you can make you know, other boxes inside those boxes. Um, but uh, if someone could come up with an AI that would take a large piece of code and make a mind map for me, I'd be very grateful and kind of tell me what piece does what piece. I spend a lot of time saying this piece does this, that piece does that. Um, so, but I do like the idea of making like software layouts that are kind of like PCB layouts, kind of like organized in different, you know, uh, spatial positions. Um, but at the end, reading that model, you kind of get this GPU control block, a job control block, and an MMU control block, which all just set an area of memory. They just say, here's a block of memory, and when you write to these locations, it's as if you're writing to a, a register on the GPU. It's just an IO map GPU register. So nothing magical here, and that's really the goal of all those layers of abstraction. I've cut it off here, but actually that mind map is actually quite, quite big. Um, and then there's also other uh, functions like read reg, write reg, and so forth. It's kind of like the lowest level, um, and they're just modeling it. So I jump back into the driver, and I go find the reg map. So the reg map is the key uh, to this particular driver that kind of tells you how to communicate with it. And looking at the reg map, you can find the job control base, the GPU control base, and the MMU uh, uh, base. And those are just offsets. So, and you can even find those macros. So I was like, what if I just make an area that is the IOM map mapped registers, and I use their macros to index into it, and I make those functions and see how far I can get there, right? because I really want to be able to debug this thing. Um, and I'm kind of deep in now. So all I do is I add some static memory inside the driver. I uh, you know, do a, grab the, the register read and the register write functions. Um, I look at the model a little more and I use their macros to overload a few of the indexes, like the ability to index and really the GPU IRQs, those are kind of you know, what's coming back from the device, the GPU. I mask those off uh, appropriately, and then the rest of it I just kind of leave up and I see how the driver's gonna work for the reg read. For the reg write, um, I you know, just write those into my map. Uh, it's not really sophisticated. And at this point I was like, how simple can I go? Uh, and after you know, working with it for a while, I figured out that there's actually these job slots. And if you just mark all those success every time you write to the device, um, the driver is happy. The driver's like, cool, everything's, everything's working just fine. So I checked and, and it's all good. So basically I compiled the model, I linked it all together, I added those reg read and the reg write uh, functions with you know, the memory, and I used their macros to keep all the indexes right, because there's actually quite a lot of, of, of uh, different uh, indexes into that, so just overloading it and using their macros saved me from having to do anything else. Um, I added in an init ram fs, 
uh, the proper QAMU, QAMU commands, and then I ran it, and actually actually compiled, actually linked, uh, and I actually started up the kernel, and it failed. So that's not you know un you know unexpected. Um, so it said it failed with a hard reset to the GPU, and what do I do? I go and find that function that has that message in it. I just find that it's a power management function. I return zero, and it works surprisingly well, actually, uh, more um, you know better than I ever expected. Um, so, of course, to demonstrate that it works, I wanted to grab an end day. So here's an old end day, um, and this end day allows you to write a pointer a zero or a one, because inside the driver, they call a function that doesn't respect the, um, uh, the pages that it's managing, the permissions of the pages that it's managing. It'll just write through to it. And it's kind of in a secondary set of ioctals that are in a job called a soft job, um, and just kind of shows you that driver writers can do whatever they want. They can make things really, really complicated or really, really easy, and often they make things really complicated. So walking through really quickly here, you can see at the top left that, you know, we're gonna put a bunch of A's in a file, and this is in an emulator, so I don't have to worry about DAC or MAC rules, um, but it's still valid. So I put a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of A's in a file, I open the file read-only in my C program, map it read-only, I run my bug, I get my uh, you know, job to run, and then when I look at the file again, the contents have actually changed. So uh, I can prove that that end day worked. I can actually debug it too, so it worked out really well. Um, and it's surprising that such a simple set of, you know, pocking out, mocking out these different register values uh, actually allowed the driver to do its work. So I don't really care about the device, I just care that it's working. Um, and in the end, I ended up writing a test case for every one of the ioctals um, and got almost all of them to work just fine uh, with, with no modification. Um, so moving on, in version 35, which is a couple years later, uh, the Molly drivers started including their own working model, and it's much more complicated than the one that I, I put in. Um, and they continue to update and release it, so I'm very happy about that. So I just, I abandoned my model at this point, um, but they've added a fuzzer inside of it, so probabilistic error generation in the IRQ, so maybe the GPU does something wrong, and then the driver needs to be robust to it. Um, they've added advanced modeling of jobs and MMU functions, um, so much more than I had put in, but you know, with just my very small model, I was able to demonstrate end days, I was very happy with it, and debug it, and find new bugs. Um, I didn't fuzz it, I, I should have got around to writing fuzzing, uh, but I, I actually didn't do that, but you could do that. Um, the new model actually supports CSF and the job management, so the driver split around 2021, uh, where they have a new command stream front end, uh, which is kind of a different way to call it than the JM, um, and that's just, completely abstracted away from the user from it in, in the user space libraries. So you don't really have to worry about that. Uh, but of course, when they added CSF, they added significant uh, complexity and of course introduced a whole bunch more bugs. So um, that seems to be the theme. Um, so I backported my model back to version five and, uh, you know, and, and started using their model from version 35 on. So then I got to thinking, like, can we improve upon this model? Like, is it actually what I need? So I noticed it was x86 only. Um, I wanted to compile it for ARM. I immediately, you know, I tried the exact same thing, compiling it for ARM, the old model and the new. Uh, and it turns out that ConfigOF, if you're not familiar with ConfigOF, it's the open uh, firmware um, flag that comes with a kernel that is mandatory in ARM. So you can work around it, but it would take a lot of work to actually, you know, remove all the pieces of code or change all the pieces of code that you would need to in order to make it work. So, but I really wanted ARM64, and of course, when you have ConfigOF, then you have to worry about DTB. Basically, ConfigOF means you have to use the device tree binary, and you have to pass it to QEMU. Um, and it turns out that I'm using QEMU to emulate. Uh, it actually has a very handy command that will dump the existing DTB that it's using, kind of a generic vanilla DTB that it's using. Then you can modify it by adding these resources and use the device tree compiler from your source tree uh, and feed it back into QMU. And now the functions that you're calling in the driver, like OF underscore get property or OF underscore um, you know, property, these different functions will actually uh, go and find what it needs uh, out of this. And these values are, they don't matter. They just matter that they're there. So you don't have to mod modify the driver even more. Because um, this is really supposed to tell it where is that register map? How big is the register map? Uh, it's supposed to tell it what interrupts I have to listen on for a job, an MMU, a GPU. 
So it's actually a very small interface for a driver, uh, which I appreciate, but this driver was actually built in order to um, be integrated as far and wide as they can, you know, could, can be. So it's very simple. Um, so I added all this stuff to the DTB, I gave that back, and it actually uh, was able to work in an ARM environment just as well as it did in x86. So then I compiled the, the module outside of the tree. So their make files don't really come without a tree make, uh, compile uh, make files. So I made my own make files, my own K build, which wasn't that hard because I stole them from Pixel. So uh, the Pixel environment builds everything with the GKI and the GKI um, you know, has everything in modules now. So I just grabbed their build system, put it on top of mine and it worked pretty well. Um, the model wasn't well maintained because this isn't really like a feature that you know, they wanna show to customers. Um, so there's lots of little debugging and patching and I actually released the model for versions five through 50 um, using uh, you know, ARM64 and KSAN uh, on this GitHub right here. So if you wanna go grab them, you can grab them, you can run them. Uh, hopefully I gave enough detail. If I didn't, you, know, you can make an issue or just email me um, and I'll, I'll fix it up for you. So you can actually play with these models and, and reproduce NDA or debug them or whatever you wanna do with them. So. The most uh, valuable thing that I got from it is a bug. You never know really what versions it spans. So I can just load a module, throw the bug, you know, load a module, throw the bug, put it back and forth and figure out exactly when did the bug start, when did the bug end, uh, for instance. And that's, that's really nice. So. so what can we use this model for? Like I said earlier, debugging, instrumentation, when you're fuzzing, um, you can get KSAN, you can get KCOV. Um, it, it's, it's actually very nice. Um, it's exactly what you want for a little effort. Um, and of course, I wanted to demonstrate some more bugs here. So here's a bug that's a couple years old now, but this was an old one that was a good one um, that I actually found using the model um, at the time. And uh, the idea is that um, the driver will write through to read-only pages. So uh, there's this idea that the, the driver wants to share pages between you and the peripheral, the GPU. You can map some pages read-only, maybe it's libc, you can import them and then you can have the GPU write to them because it's mismanaging it. It's not in one particular instance, it's pinning the pages, but it's not respecting the, uh, the read write VMA. So it and actually will write through to them. So you can imagine how if you wrote to libc, you could pivot around the system um, or, or cause other, other mischief. So, and this happens in the get user pages uh, remote. Um, the actual vulnerable line here is, uh, Hopefully you can see it. It's in the region dash flags and it with that KBase reg GPU write flag. So those flags, the GPU write, the, there's a CPU write flag also. Um, and they didn't consider the CPU write flag. So basically they're saying, uh, we're considering if uh, you can write to it from the GPU and we're respecting that write, but we're not respecting the ability to write from the CPU, which means we can do it. Uh, so when you pin the pages on this path, when you're, you do a job and the job needs some pages, it'll pin them. And then you can, you, know, you can pin imported pages to the driver. There's a lot that I'm not showing you here, but uh, just, just trust me that you can do that. And so what I like to do when I'm you know, doing a bug, uh, making a bug is uh, to really understand it, I you know, try to make them uh, uh, people. So like I'm in the middle of user space, I'm talking to the kernel and, I'm, and I can talk to the driver through the kernel. And this bug in particular, uh, you know, the, the user space is kind of like, I would like some anonymous memory, the dri you know, the kernel's like, thanks. And then we give that anonymous memory to the driver. The driver makes a record of it. It says that that particular uh, memory is read write because it looks at the VMA, that's all good. Uh, then of course, I replace the memory by unmapping the anonymous memory and then moving some read only memory and remap libc, my mapping of libc and the mapping is shared. That's really the key here is that it's a shared mapping. So everybody in the system will be able to see it. It's not doing copy on write these pages or anything that you could, but I guess you could, but. Anyway, uh, then I go and I ask the, the GPU to map those pages back out, but I map them back out uh, read write. And the reason that works is because the GPU only kept that address. It's kind of like, oh, whatever was at that address, that's read write, because I have a reservation for it. And of course, then it'll pin the wrong pages from my read only library, and then I can write through it. And of course, the Molly GPU DMAs everything, so that's perfect. Like, I love it. I, I don't have to worry about you know, other mitigations or, or signature checks. I can just DMA straight to the physical memory. And of course, I'm, I'm DMAing to FizzMem that's in the page cache for the file system. So I'm not actually writing to the file system. So if I reboot, everything's fine. It's great. So even if I, I can't really mess things up, too bad. Um, another thing I like to do is write down, uh, you know, kind of all the primitive calls. So these are all the calls that are 
involved in this particular exploit and a little demonstration, as I said before. So I'm not going to dwell on it too much. I'll post the slides later. People can kind of pick through that if you would like to look at that bug. And then one of the cool things you can do with the bug is you can reproduce, or the emulator, or, yeah, I mean, I'll just call it the emulator, uh, is you can uh, reproduce end days. So Jan Horn has been putting a lot of good bugs uh, on the bug tracker for Project Zero. I download them, look at them, run them in the emulator, uh, under, and they work great. So this is just a quick demonstration of a POC that he put up there. And basically the driver is mismanaging those physical pages. It's holding on to them too long uh, when they're actually not under the management of the driver anymore, but it's got stale entries uh, in the driver. So you're able to use the driver to manipulate the pages that are now being reused by the kernel. And of course, in this case, uh, if you wanna go download this POC, it's right there. Um, and I just put a tiny little you know, fork spray in it so I could, and set the comms above everything. And I called the, the comm field Easter egg. Um, and so I could see the pages. And if I wanted to, I could stop all over them and crash it. So uh, I can reproduce us on device. And that's another thing here is I can reproduce this in the emulator uh, across the versions I care about. A lot of times I've actually gone to stores to buy devices and I'm you know, dismayed that they actually updated the driver or fixed the bug that I wanted to test on that device. So with this, I don't have to worry about that so much. Um, so how are these models made? Um, getting out to how are they made, they actually cut out pieces of code. If you go look at config molly no molly and you look at you know, what they did to the driver to make this actually happen, they cut out some of the initialization code, they cut out the power management code, timers and IRQs, they just cut all that out. Um, and, or they would put in stub functions. So maybe that function is called from a lot of different places. So since it's called from a lot of different places, they just put a stub in there, no big deal. Um, they actually made a static buffer in their model the same way I did. Uh, and that just overloads the IO remaps, i.e. the registers that you wanna talk to. Um, and then they uh, mock up the status registers to kind of say, everything's cool, boss. You know, what you just sent me, I processed it and it was successful all the time. So limitations of this approach. One of the big limitations is you're not gonna get those IRQs. You're not gonna get those memory faults from the device in any shared memory context uh, or situation. So you can't really emulate the IRQs or MMUs without effort, right? And I want no effort. Um, so I wanna do as little as possible. Uh, so the nice part is, is usually those IRQ paths are not hard to find. Usually you can find the callbacks pretty readily. Usually they're in the init function somewhere that they're setting them up. Um, and when you find them, you can audit them directly. So you don't have to worry, or you could even write functions that call them if you some, you know, uh, want to. Uh, and of course the paths aren't usually very that long or very long, but there were bugs uh, up until very recently in the IRQ paths. And a quick bug right here uh, in the bottom right in the MMU page fault worker. So if you've got a shared mapping between the two and the, the GPU actually faults, it will transfer control via IRQ back to the AP and now the AP will actually run this function and try to satisfy the memory request. And you can see uh, at the top of this block here, it's, it's got a GPU VM unlock, and that's just a really shallow function that will unlock, uh, it will relinquish control of the, um, the regions. And the regions are loosely uh, VMAs that it's duplicated. And down here you can see it's derepping one of the regions. So this is about a 10 instruction race in an IRQ handler. So I never really pursued it, I don't even know if you can hit it, but it is a bug. So, so I got to thinking like, why is this possible? So I thought this would be much more difficult than it really was. Like, how did this actually work? I was really just kind of messing around to get it to work. Um, and I think the answer is that uh, what these drivers that are the coprocessors, they're not for hot pluggable devices. These aren't keyboards or mice or you know, thumb drives. These are actually devices that are built in or integrated on package. So since they're integrated, um, they're guaranteed to be there. So they use the platform driver. So a platform driver, way back in the day when uh, Linux was young, uh, you had to uh, put all the drivers into the kernel that were going to be used by that kernel. Uh, you had to coordinate all the IRQs up, up front, all the memory regions that you wanted to use and share, but well, not maybe share, but like the ones that were used to control the device. Those all had to be negotiated up front and built into the kernel. And if you wanted to add a driver, you had to recompile your kernel. I don't know if anybody remembers those days, it was a while ago, but those were platform drivers and the coprocessors still use platform drivers and that's the reason. Um, I found this article from 2011 that basically says, we don't like platform drivers, we would love everything to be disco discoverable like PCI, kind of just dynamic, but they still use platform drivers in, in coprocessors because um, they're just easier. Um, 
So what lessons can we learn? Like uh, I kind of went down this path uh, on this particular surface and found out what these other developers were doing and I kind of completed the code and then I used their model and what I learned is that you can cut out relevant code, you can stub things out, make static resources, you can really just hack up the driver in a very conservative way, mostly during an init, and it will actually run. So I was like, maybe we should go and do this to every driver. Like, why can't we do this to just anything else really, any other platform driver? Um, and I love coprocessors, so I was like, I'm gonna go work on the MSM NPU driver. And I found some new problems that arose immediately, because it's a very small driver. It's not very complicated. Well, it's a complicated device, but the driver itself is pretty small. So if you remember, ARM wants like the adoption of their, their GPU to be wide. It's in everything. It's in my handhold main device. It's, it's in my um, you know, TV. It's in cars. It's everywhere. So they made a very simple interface, and they made it very easy to integrate. So other vendors like Qualcomm, will, they will sell you the device, they'll sell you the AP, and everything integrated together. So they control the kernel, they control the drivers, and they'll sell you everything at once. Um, so they don't really have external pressure to like revision their code. Now, they do release their code on Code Lanaro if you know where to look. Um, but they augment their kernel and their drivers quite a bit. So I couldn't just take a vanilla Linux kernel and then just take their driver and stick it in there without having all these unresolved symbols and all these extra things they added to the kernel. And I was like, what? I thought we were in the age of the GKI, like the generic kernel image. That was a, an effort at Google, if you're not familiar. And all the kernels were going to be the same. So I'm going to digress a little bit into the GKI. I don't know if anybody knows or had experience with this, but... Uh, Back in 2020 and before, the kernels were very fragmented and had all kinds of stuff in them, right? Lots of different things uh, that not only that Android would add, but the vendors would add and the OEMs would add. And so you kind of got these LTS kernels and we would say, this is the kernel we want, 419 or 510 or 515, and that would become the kernel that was in Android. So AOSP would have this kernel. And then you would have the vendors like Samsung add things to it or MediaTek or whoever. And then you'd have somebody else add more things to it like AT&T. And of course, that's a nightmare for updates. Um, and it's really fragmented and they added some really bad things into the kernel that made it very insecure. Um, so they were like, Google's getting a bad rap. We're like, we're gonna take control of the kernel. You know, kind of put everything that you guys want in mo loadable modules and we're gonna, we're gonna make the kernel like the same everywhere. And I think the reason it's called the generic kernel uh, image is because that was what they aspired to. So let's actually see how that actually played out. Not only did they put everything in kernel uh, modules, the BSP code, the SOC code, and the modules, which are on the file system, and I, I really thought that the generic kernel was generic, uh, they added this other goal, and it's to maintain a stable and consistent and tested KMI, kernel module interface, which I was like, great, that's awesome. Don't break the modules that exist. We want to be able to load them all. And don't break user space, and this will allow them to backport security mechanisms. So if you look into KMI a little more, um, it turns out that they want to maintain a stable kernel module interface. That's great. And they want to ship all the binaries and not have to recompile all the modules or rebuild all user space. Uh, but they do allow kernel code changes. And I was kind of like, how is that possible? I thought this kernel was supposed to be generic. Um, so th the goal of the GKI is to reduce kernel fragmentation by aligning with the upstream kernel. But I found this line that says, there are valid reasons why some patches can't be accepted upstream and there are product schedules that must be met. So this is on Google's website, and they're kind of just putting a hole in it. Not, not a huge one, not like, you know, flashy, not like saying like, go ahead and add everything you want to the kernel, but that's what people did. So it turns out that they knew that this was gonna happen, and so they made some official kind of macros that allowed you to extend structures. So don't take away, but you can add to. So they added these uh, macros in there that you can put inside your Android uh, common kernel. So these are the Android common kernel ones. Then you've got macro extensions uh, for structures that you can add space for the vendors and space for the OEMs. And so you can find these easy enough with grep. Um, they don't, they're not actually used as much as you would think. Uh, however, when it comes to the KMI, you can actually submit code to Google. If you add the symbols and functions you want to add to the kernel, and add them to this STG file, uh, and then push them to AOSP for review, they'll review them, and then they'll create a KMI image that's specific for you. Maybe you're Qualcomm, maybe you're Samsung. So as long as you don't break what exists there, you can add more to it. So the GKI isn't really generic. I would say uh, it's managed. So they shouldn't have used the word generic, they should have called it managed kernel interface. 
uh, because uh, does this actually improve fragmentation? Does it improve security? And I think it does because instead of a vendor or an OEM just adding things to the kernel that you know they want, uh, you have to actually ask Google. You have to say, hey, Google, you know, add, add this to, uh, and they'll, they'll review it, and then they'll issue a KMI. So if you download the Pixel 9 uh, kernel source right now, um, you can find uh, this directory, the Android directory, that will have the STG file of all the symbols and functions that they want to add. And they have a KMI here. That's, they have a build process called the Hermetic Build Process. So uh, I don't know what makes it Hermetic, but that's what they called it. Um, and it will grab this KMI and say, did you change anything that affects this particular ABI, this kernel interface? And if you didn't, we're all good to go. That doesn't mean you can't add things to it. It just means that, you know, it's consistent. And so I, I think they should have called it managed kernel interface. But what does this mean for what I want to do? Um, basically what it means is I need to copy all the specific code that Qualcomm added to their kernel that affects this driver into my kernel so that I can build it, so that I can get the module to build against it, then I can load it. So different things like completions. Completions are something Qualcomm added to their code base. Um, other things that, that they really needed. So, uh, but I kind of run the same formula uh, on this driver. I cut out the IRQs, I cut out the, the power management stuff, I mock up different functions that are failing, add a DTB entries that I can grab. Qualcomm has a, data, uh, a get of all the DTBs uh, and, the, and DTSs that have examples. Add some static memory for the IO reg, as in this case, there's six different places. They have six different register banks um, and six different sets of macros. Um, and I overwrite the register read and the register write functions. And actually, it, it took me about one day to do this. So, um, and I loaded it into the kernel that, of course, I've kept patch sets for my kernel and patch sets for the driver. Um, but with minimal changes, I was able to get the driver to run. This one's not polished up yet, but I, I plan on, on releasing some more of these. Um, and it's really, it's really nice to be able to debug an instrument in fuzz. So, so now moving on to why are there still bugs in drivers? Um, I started thinking about this a while ago, but, and it's kind of bugged me, but who really has the responsibility for these bugs? Well, it's obviously like Qualcomm or whoever the driver writer is. So it's not Linux, they can't really take responsibility for all this code. Um, it's not the product vendors, they're kind of the users, right? Like Samsung's gonna integrate this package into its new phone. And so they're not gonna take responsibility for it yet. They're the user, they paid someone else for this driver. Um, but the peripheral drivers, uh, developers, they have like hardware people and they have software people and the focus really is on functionality. So getting those user space libraries developed first, getting the hardware functionality working and testing and the driver just ends up being kind of a second priority. Um, I think really the iron triangle of product management, the better, faster, cheaper applies across the industry where people do faster and cheaper because that's what customers want. That's what gets them the dollars. They're following the triangle. And better is a quality thing where we've all gotten used to kind of crappy software. We're all kind of like, oh, it crashed. No big deal, I'll reboot it. Uh, as long as it doesn't crash too often, we're all cool with it. So. As consumers, we're not really demanding better, better quality, or at least we're tolerating bad quality. And then the quality comes later with patches, and we're like, oh, I got to update. We've just all become normalized and desensitized the idea that I need an update. Like, that's just a thing. Okay. Um, and I, I, I know they're trying. So Microsoft uh, recently has tied the individual developer performance to uh, the number of security bugs or this insecure code that they write, which I think is kind of harsh. Um, and then also they're using AI. Um, and I do believe that the co-pilots will be useful. They'll probably help quite a bit, but I'm curious about what their false positive rate. With any static analysis tool, there's always a false positive rate. So if they become too chatty, do people ignore them? That's really what I wanna know there. And I haven't talked to anybody yet that's really used them. So then there might be other things that might solve the drivers in the kernel. So what happened to Rust? I was a few years ago, and this happens uh, throughout my, my career so far is that VR is going to end because we're going to have memory safe languages or, or, or we're going to have this new mitigation and, and it seems to keep going. Um, and apparently Rust kind of fell apart this week uh, when the maintainer stepped down um, and they were kind of hinting at that, you know, we hope that a new OS that's written in a memory safe language doesn't come along and make Linux obsolete the same way Linux made Unix obsolete, which is a little bit of a veiled threat. Um, but I do think that's the right, the right way to go. Um, because they tried to change an entire community that had been devoting their lives to the Linux kernel and working on it for free for a very long time. 
So you can't just come in and change everything on people as something that big, um, especially when there's really no compensation. Uh, bug bounty programs, I would love to see uh, people like Qualcomm put out these pre-silicone environments, release them to the community, extend a bug bounty program, and give us the ability to instrument and debug. I think it would improve uh, our community, but also uh, improve their products. Um, in the meantime, I'm gonna build a lot of these driver models. So, um, and I guess I'll just keep putting them out. If you have a problem with any of them, and believe me, they're, they're just proof of concepts, although I have used the Molly one uh, myself and, and it does work pretty well. Um, so, in conclusion, um, getting back to vulnerability discovery, I think this is a valid way if you want to do vulnerability discovery on drivers is to just get the code and try to compile it and then fix it all up, get it into an emulator. At that point, just the process of going through that will give you a lot of information and it will tell you how it works. So you don't really need to know that much about the driver going in other than just start interacting with it. There was a portion of my career where I kind of just sat and stared at things. I'm reverse engineering and just staring at things and I'm thinking the bugs are gonna come up in my brain and I'm just gonna be able to pick them out. Um, but no, it, it turns out it's a lot more effective to actually just you know, work with it and hack on it and, and be, have my hands on it. Um, and with drivers, especially with Linux drivers, even if they're not open source, you usually can find leaks somewhere in a distro and you can just grab them and just see what happens. So I encourage people not to be afraid of the kernel, just, just keep pounding on it and see what happens. Um, I think the bar for VR on things like drivers can be lowered quite a bit by this process. Um, and uh, yeah, you don't really need to go to the extreme of making a full development environment or full emulator environment or finding like a full development environment. Those are kind of extremes. There is kind of this middle way where you just have to do enough to find the bugs you're looking for and then you're done. So, that's all I got. Question? Yep, any questions? Right there. Mm -hmm. What was your uh, wall clock time on looking at this project? Like, when did you start? Uh, so for the Molly drivers, uh, it took me quite a bit to understand what they were doing. So that was over the course of about six weeks. But once I understood and kind of understood this path, uh, when I created the NPU driver, just the very hacked together one, about nine hours. Um, and that, uh, most of that was just being me, me being mad at the GKI wasn't really the GKI. And then I had to copy over all these structures uh, because I'm still on the path of making a vanilla kernel and only modifying it as little as possible um, just to get the behavior I want. So but about nine hours for the NPU one, but now that I know what I'm doing. So, thanks. Any more questions? So you mentioned uh, the specific things that were stubbed out and you said you, you know, like IRQ, for example, you just manually audit those. That still misses a lot of like potential state things. It feels like in terms of like code that's flowing in and out of them and back and forth. Do you do you have kind of thoughts about expanding it to handle better like bigger picture state issues between those, or do you feel that's kind of covered by the manual auditing that you referred to? Uh, I really uh, just do those with manual auditing. Usually, uh, when things are coming back from the device, they want to handle it very quickly. Usually, in a top half and bottom half kind of way. So usually, there's not too many of them. If it did get bigger than that, I would try to automate it in some way. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Any more in the back? Too bad. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, it's coming. Have you considered taking your efforts and actually porting them into QMU as kind of a stub device? Because then you wouldn't have to recompile um, every time or change the versions and keep up with what ARM's putting out? I, I didn't quite understand the question, sorry. So. Uh, the QMU C code base is very similar to Linux kernel oh, base. So yes. have you considered making a stub device for QMU and then yes. you plug that in and then you don't have to rebuild that for every driver? Yes. And I have seen projects that have done that where they download the QMU source, they modify it, and then they build that, and then they have to build the kernel. Uh, I didn't go that way because I'm lazy. I was kind of like, well, then I'm pegged to this particular version of QMU, but I also have to learn their structures. And I was like, okay. that's just too much learning. That's not like directly contributing to what I'm trying to do. Um, but yeah, that, that is a valid approach. If there's no more questions, then I think uh, we're good. Thanks, everybody.